Parsons got me on the moon. Jack Parsons got me on the moon. Hello everybody and welcome to a springtime, well early springtime, and you're being serenaded by the sound of the rain falling around me. So if you're bothered by that, I don't care. If you like it, it'll be nice and atmospheric. Welcome back to the Velocity of Now with me, your host Thomas Sheridan. And uh, it's a dark time now, there's a lot of uh, psychic turbulence going on, there's a lot of uh, movement of the ren fields and the polluted ones and the toxic ones and the the demon possessed ones and they're manifesting left right and center and as usual you know the story with a demon is to ignore it and to stay well clear of it they are the hells from the abyss are only are only fed by reciprocation never ever indulged them so i thought we'd have a a nice little introspective atmospheric von and we live in very challenging times and i've always been a great believer in two things to deal with this psychology and sorcery and you know thinking sideways thinking diagonally the world becomes a different place when you stop following uh, the trajectory you don't become irrational you don't become destabilized you don't become agitated you move in paths and trajectories away from the norm for only in moving away from the paradigm direct current flow that solutions to transcend where it's taking you spool themselves into manifestation this would be a good time to indulge allegories and metaphor i'll give you an allegory i'll give i just think about this the other day imagine you're in the middle of a river and that river is flowing along and you've been in that river all your life and you've been in the center of that river and it's moving along and then one day you realize that the purpose of this river was to power a hydroelectric power station and if you stay on that river in the position that you're in you will be torn to pieces inside the hydroelectric blades in order to generate electricity and spewed out as particulates and basically slurry on the other side into a lake a stagnant lake so you realize this and you say to yourself 
I can be churned up in those blades and generate electricity for the greater good? Or why should I sacrifice myself? I should just get out of this river and get to the bank and stop going with the flow. Now this is the moment when you step into consciousness as a person. This is the moment when you arrive at the point where you say to yourself, I'm going to take responsibility for my own psychic stewardship. How many years have I been saying this on VON and other outlets to you about this? This is the point where my psychic stewardship is going to override that of being another one of the masses. I'm not going to be turned into slop going through the play through the blades of that turbine. So you say, well there's two shores. There's a left bank and a right bank. I'm right in the middle. Which do I go to? The left bank or the right bank? Which do I swim towards? They're both going to be difficult to get to because this is a fast flowing river. It's continually going to push me towards the, the turbine blades. So you look on both sides and you say, well, they both look basically the same. It doesn't matter if it's left or right. I see forests and fields and trees on either side. And then that's basically it. But then you see in the distance on, say, the right hand side, you see what looks like a town. And you say, well, my chances of surviving would be better there than going into the wilderness right now because I don't have the skills to do that. So you see that as kind of a, an option to get you out. Say, I'll start swimming towards the right bank. So you start swimming towards the right bank. You turn, you make a 90 degree turn, face to the right, and you start swimming. What happens? Nothing. You're still being sent down the center of the river towards the turbines miles away in the distance. And along the way, people have been shouting from the side of the banks, get out of the river, get out of the river. You're heading towards a turbine. You'll be chopped up. And most of the people around you are laughing, going, ha, 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 conspiracy theorists. And some are even going, well, I don't care if it's a turbine. It's for the greater good. And then you and a handful of others are like, you know, what if there is a turbine? At least if, if they're lying, it makes no difference. I can just stand, I can stand at the side of the river and walk down along the bank and see if there's a turbine or not. And then if there isn't, get back in the river. Or if I get to the bank and there is a turbine, I'm saved. So the, it seems to be the sensible option is the one that gives you the two choices and that swim towards the bank. But you're swimming towards the bank at a 90 degree angle and you can't get out of the current flow. So then you say to yourself, the only way I'm going to get out of this is to turn myself at a 45 degree angle diagonally and swim towards the bank. And then you suddenly find Instead, you're actually moving a little sideways. You're no longer in the center. And you continue along that 45 degree direct tra tra trajectory. And uh, you're heading towards the bank. It's going to be a long, hard, painful struggle. But you're on your way. You're no longer stuck in the middle. You're realizing that you're taking the diagonal path. And that diagonal path is your path to salvation. Not the straight and narrow not going with the flow, but thinking sideways, thinking outside the linear path. You're now developing a sense within yourself of non-linear survival against linear warfare. And it, but this, has, this is not easy either, because as you're now moving away from the center, suddenly you're getting bashed with people who are flowing downhill, going, get back in line, you get back in line, you weirdo. Get back, go to move, go back and down. We're going down river. Get back in line and pushing you down, pushing you along. So what you thought would be a straightforward forty-five degree angle to the bank is now becoming a long, arduous journey of others smashing into you because uh, they want to go straight. So you're being pushed down further. So it's not. It's a very. It's no longer a direct angle. It's a long, hard, arduous struggle. But among those that are crashing into you, that are smashing into you, occasionally 
you will find, you will hit someone else who's also heading towards the right side of the bank at 45 degrees are trying to get a 45 degrees and they go oh hey 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 man how's it going you trying to get off away from the turbines oh i am too i guess these these idiots are smashing into us and trying to push us down what if we strap ourselves together so if one of these idiots hits, hits us they won't have the the power to knock us off path so then you bond with another person and then you have double the strength of the ones the individuals hitting you so instead of them hitting you and 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 pushing you further down towards the turbine blades they're bouncing around off you and you're slowing them up you're slowing them up and uh, as the, and they're caught in you and they say, get out of my way you goddamn conspiracy theorists you freaks you losers you have tinfoil nut uh, nut jobs and then you push them off and says well you can go and go go into blades we don't care and you go the weirdos and they go off but then you hit 10 or 20 or 30 of them and then you get another third person that goes oh you guys are heading for the banks can i kind of strap myself onto you and we'll, we'll paddle us we'll, we'll we'll paddle and swim as three and suddenly you know the bank is suddenly attainable you found your tribe and eventually five or six of you make it to the bank and then you make it to the bank and god we made it we're not going to get chewed up in the turbine blades and then some guys pa- hands you a pair of binoculars and you look down the river and you see it, there is indeed really a turbine and the conspiracy theorists and the whack jobs are telling you the truth all along and of this the seven of you no of the eight of you that's on the side of the bank seven of you run to the new the new town the new village to begin a new life but one of you has this desire to stand at the side of the bank and continue warning the others and they're standing at the side of the bank and they're going hey everybody hey everybody get off the river get off the river you're heading towards the turbines and they're all they're called, they're called far right nut jobs it's conspiracy theorists tinfoil hat wearing whack jobs fruit loops and then occasionally one out of maybe a, a ten thousand might listen to them and go you know uh, just in case i'll swim to the bank well they're the evangelical types and they mean well but after a while they have to stop doing that and going back to the village with the other the other eight uh, because they will die at the side of the bank that's the point they realize that i've done enough altruism i've done enough philanthropy i've done enough warning the sheeple we want to call them the masses the renfields and i'm going to go into the village and now take care of myself and that's an honorable thing what's dishonorable is they continue staying on the bank until they fall back in the river again and they get chewed up on the turbine blades because they didn't they didn't they didn't continue on the, the diagonal path they stayed they stayed adjacent to the flow until it sucked them back in again when the bank collapsed and there's a big point in all that that we can only we can only warn alert spread information so much uh, to the point where it's not enough anymore and you say to yourself i've done my bit my conscience is clear and now it's me time now i'm running to the village to begin the new world the new life the new existence and there's a there's a great wisdom in realizing that you've done enough that you've you, you've done enough i i think i've done a fair little bit in my last 10 years to try and help people whether i've brought people out of the current flow i don't know i i don't i think they were already out i probably just gave them a little bit of guidance or a little bit of uh morale boosting and the day and I, and I and i know that me saying this i am still one of the ones standing at the side of the river but um i am approaching the point where i will be in the next few years walking towards the village and i'll be done uh because again i i you know i want to spend the, the, the second half of my life doing more things for myself i won't run away you know but i, I think i want to uh, uh, you know you can only do so much and i'll be doing bonds as long as i'm alive but this uh, there is a point where i want to step away from being visible and let other people take over 
in this regard. And at the end of the day, I've realized that the most important thing of all in this world is individuality. This is why they want you in the collective. This is why they want you in communitarianism. This is why they use the most despicable term in the his the two most despicable terms that have ever been created in the history of the human race are no fire without smoke, no smoke without fire, and for the greater good. Those things have been those two phrases are have been issued it have been issued time and time again by genocidal maniacs, tyrants, witch burners, and the kind of people who pointed out Anne Frank. The potbangers. The potbangers and all those types. And you will never, no matter how many times, how many years, if you die on the bank of that river, you will never reach them. I mean, there was a comment on Neil Oliver's most recent video when someone said, but what do we do when we give everyone we know this information and even the ones you knew were sentient and could accept in the past are still not listening? You go to the village. You go to the village. That's the that's the gods telling you that the message is over. And the only reason I'm still at, at the side of the river at this stage, late stage in the game for me is that I'm still finding people who are listening. And I'm still finding people who are are who who want that that moral boost when they get to the bank i will say to them okay you did it get to the village that's the reason i'm still here also i like sharing my philosophy in life now how you know this came this became apparent to me now i, I was always an unconventional child and not uh, you know i was always like that a misfit from the time i was young but i don't mean i never i was actually a very good kid i never did drugs or drank or got into trouble with the law. I did once when I was messing with a motorcycle outside the flats in Ballymun, and I was just playing with the gears on it, and a cop car came down Shangan Road. I was about nine at the time, and I got frightened. Someone said, the cops are here, and it was more, well, I didn't get frightened. It was more, the co- I'll, I'll run, and, we, and I ran. But by running away from, not, from a scene that could have looked like a crime scene, like damaging a motorcycle, but wasn't, the copper got me, and it was the only time I was ever dragged to a police station. And uh, they let me go after a few hours, but they just they were just bullying assholes who just wanted to torture me and were enjoying it for sadosexual masochist. This is another thing. Most of the evil people you'll ever meet in your life are into BDSM. Most of the people who try to take you down in your life or or stab you in your back in your life are into BDSM. They're 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 into. They've got that wife beater chic going on thing, or the kind of women who are attracted to wife beaters, and um, you'll always find that's a, a a constant with them. And that that copper was just a typical BDSM copper, stinking in his grave now, I'm sure. But you know the maggots. But um, that was the only time I was a good kid, but I was a misfit, and I wasn't like other kids. You know, was, I found other kids like me who were the other things like. You know, the kind of... But I wasn't the kind of kid who was, like, going around trying to be like every other kid. I mean, I knew right from the time I was at very, very young. I remember one time sitting on the bus, and I was looking out the window at the react, the people on the streets, and I said, they're all mad. And I was very young when I said this. Probably 10, 9, 10. And I, I said... I, I came with the name Blids. And Blids were people... That was the, the, the NPC, the word I used for NPC... And I wish I knew as much about NPCs when I was growing up as I did now, because I was always trying to be appease people or be nice to people or being understanding, or like many of you listening to this show, made the fatal mistake of thinking that what feelings, inclinations, thoughts, and emotions that are inside you are also inside that person you're talking to. This is a this is why I think future generations going on from us going forward are going to be aware of the npc that we weren't and if our bunch if our bunch have bequeathed a a phenomenal gift to people now and if you're listening to this and you're in your 20s consider yourself very lucky we bequeathed the gift of the notion that the consciousness of the person you're talking to could be very very different than what you are and you will learn to not waste your time on people that there is nothing inside. There is no inner world. And I've wasted so many years of my life with that. I've wasted so many years of my life with people like that. 
and that was only because um human decency i, I thought basically you know ah well you, you know the whole go along to get along that thing will kill you doesn't mean you could turn, and turn into an, a recluse or an asshole looks down on others but you you should look at be like the hermit card you should be the quiet stranger you know like the old kung fu movies we watched the kids in the 70s and 80s and there'd be a big fight in a bar in hong kong and there'd be some guy sitting in the corner and as the tables and chairs are flying around he's just sitting there looking and he might be smoking a cigarette and he's and then there's a table flies in front of him and there's all the chaos of all the fighting and then suddenly he puts the cigarette out in the ashtray and then does something amazing like takes out 20 fellows at one kick you know or that's it that's that's what you have to be the one in the corner who observes and we you know it's only since basically you know 2000 and the mid 2010s 2000 and after 2012 2000, towards 2016 that the emergence of the understanding of the npc came into popular understanding and we all realized my god that was what was going on all along i was talking to an empty container i was dealing with an empty vessel i was trying to explain something into a bottomless abyss i'll i'll stop here for a second and let you ponder and let your mind i'll give you a minute of listening to the rain falling and you will have a minute or so of thinking about those kinds of people in your life that you encountered that I just described where you suddenly have now realized I was talking to something that was incapable of listening. It's remarkable how you will often not only remember the big individual associations, people you were in relationships or friends with or worked with, where this empty vessel rule applies now and you and all the understanding now makes sense. But I often found when I did this exercise in the past of t- taking a minute or two just to remember, it was often the most mundane little things mundane little things you know like our brief one-off encounters that left a huge impression on me for the simple fact is that they were so blindsidingly empty i can remember one time there was a 21st birthday party i was going to this is when i was about 20 or 21 myself and so a friend of mine had brought over some relatives and it was they were about, say, about the same age, uh, maybe a bit older, and they'd gotten engaged, sort of couple. And uh, I just walked up to them and said, "Oh, how's it going? Nice to meet you." Shook their hand. I'm Thomas, whatever their name was, dickhead and wagon. And uh, so I said, "I've never been to this place. It, it was being held in Liberty Hall in Dublin." I said, "I've never been to the the social centre in Liberty Hall in Dublin. Is is it? What's it like?" And they looked at each other like what did he say i didn't say something that was out of the blue in terms of like have you heard that the the ncg intergalactic catalog of galaxies has just changed 
the rating from NGC 45672 from a spiral galaxy to a cluster. I didn't say something like that. I simply said, I've never been to the social club inside Liberty Hall. Have you been there yourself? Do you know what it's like? They had never been asked by anyone before about the social club at Liberty Hall. So therefore, it was a strange question to them because the the answer to that question had not been programmed into them. And the concept of extrapolating a conceptualization of that concept in that like, no, we've never been there. I'm kind of interested to see what it's like wasn't there so these two airheads looked at each other and like what language is he talking it was that basic i'll always remember that it was a basic question they couldn't answer and it wasn't until 2017 for feck's sake that i realized that's what though she could always book me the lack of the lack of brain power the lack of engagement uh, were they, they were being rude? Was I was my fly open? My willy and balls were hanging out. I couldn't ever understand that reaction, and the reaction was they were both dead inside and incapable of formulating a conceptual imagining of an is of a situational dynamic that ev- that I thought all of us were capable of, and that was two NPCs in a relationship. And I bet you're remembering mundane little things like that. So, from an early age, I just I just developed a set of toolkits, and I'm sure lots of you listening to Velocity of Narrative were the same, that revolved around ways of transcending or just surviving being an oddball in the world. Being not knowing that this was not what you were meant to be. That this conformity was not going to benefit you in any way. In fact, it would destroy you. Now, I know all of us, including myself, have gone along to get along. We tried to play the game. We tried to be like one of them. We tried to fit in with the crowd. And it was absolute, paralyzingly horrific misery. You were, you know, think of a wedding. You go to a wedding, most weddings. I mean, I, I was up in at weddings like oh, not too long ago. That was, was, it was an unconventional wedding. It was the only reason I went. But God, think of a conventional wedding and how horrific that experience is, unless you're an NPC, how horrific that experience is, if you're anyway sentient. And then having to live, try to live life in that way and you're miserable every moment because of the horrific pressures, these horrific pressures to conform. And you realise what it's like and you you cannot... If you're an NPC, it's no problem. You just run, you just run the program. But if you're anyway sentient, it tears you asunder. And this is where all the suicides and depression and stuff. This is why this is why they have this horrible thing of teen suicide, young men killing themselves. That they 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 know that they can't fit into society because it's painful to try and do it. This is why it's so bad in small town communities and rural areas. But they don't think they haven't learned yet that there's a way out, and that's the greatest tragedy of all. That's why I hope some of them, when they're young, listen to these broadcasts and realise there is very much a way out. Reject that which has been given to you. Not all fruit that grows on trees are nourishing. And the understanding, you know, when you say to yourself, like, okay, it will be about demarcation and safe spaces before safe spaces became what it became now but you know drawing a box around yourself and saying this shape this box this circle this triangle that i've created around my feet this is my protection and my limitations of what i'm about to do or how i think will be determined with inside this box and that allows me to maintain control so when someone says to you uh, I'm thinking of getting married in the spring and I say well best of luck to you. I'll buy you a present but don't invite me to the wedding why not I don't go to weddings don't take it personally but I'll definitely buy you a present and I, have, I wish you all the happiness immediately you have drawn you've stayed within there 
you know, that kind of thing. You're in the job and they have a boss who's a dickhead and the boss says, there's going to be some big changes around here. It's a hell out there and anyone who's not pulling their weight will be going. And you immediately look at your watch and go, hmm, it's four o'clock. The employment agency ends, closes at six. I better go down and look for a new job. That you draw on the line saying, this guy's not going to do it to me. I will go look for another job. And you will find that once you start doing this, like when you swim diagonally towards the bank, that people of like mind, your tribe starts to cluster with you. You meet people on the diagonal path. Because li- life changes. About 2000, and, and this is, of course, how I became involved in magic. Because then I realized that I was, by default, creating a magic circle. And the purpose of the magic circle is what takes place inside the circle cannot be... Is, it's, a, it's a wall of protection. It's a domain it is a, a, a temple perimeter. You know, guard your sacred temple. All temples have walls. They are not open. Even the Druidic terms, temples in the forest, they had groves made up of demarcation lines of trees. There, You cannot have a temple without a, a boundary. You cannot have a sacred or magical space without a line of demarcation. And that's what you are. That's what your nation is. And so on. So that, that that's what led me is growing up into magic. I understood, well, okay, there's a protective aspect here through, you know, confinement and containment. That kind of thing. And what you can you can only you can only safeguard, grow, maintain stewardship over what's inside that demarcation circle that line or that triangle you've drawn around yourself you can only affect what's in there what goes on outside of it you can't affect and this this liberates you from thinking you can and this is why people who are activists who think they can change the world or telescopic philanthropists who think they can stand in Ireland and screaming on the internet will change something in the Middle East are literally destroying themselves they're dissolving themselves because they're stepping outside their own lines of demarcation, their own sacred space, and wrecking themselves. Stay within it. Observe what's outside, but realize that you can only direct, affect, affect, and protect, most importantly, what's in. Now, you can move that circle, that space, that sacred domain, true society, true existence, true civilization true reality in ways like the guy swimming towards the bank diagonally which will get which will gather experience and power and charge and will interrupt the flow of reality now this is important there's an awful lot of nonsense being spewed particularly by david Icke and his followers about simulation theory and they haven't got a clue what simulation theory is simulation they're confusing simulation theory with that of the quantum theoretical model as developed by the Copenhagen School. Simulation theory is a Gnostic, Calvinist, Lutheran view of quantum physics in that everything you experience, even your desire to hack the matrix, is pre-programmed by a programmer using protocols. It could it could be an alien it could be an advanced supercomputer it could be a god it could be anything but the program is run and this is why it appeals so much to globalists and abrahamics and doomers that you have no free will and these same ones are going i believe in simulation theory okay so you believe you're in an eternal prison and every impulse inclination experience you have has been programmed by an exterior pathological program no 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 i can i can i can i can maintain i can hack the matrix by 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 copenhagen double slit no you just you just you just that's not simulation theory that's classical theoretical quantum physics Oh, what you did you talk about? Did you rip it out? Did you rip it? You see, they don't know. So simulation theory is the most... I would say that the most evil thing that's been invented by the psychopathic control grid since original sin 
has been the, the concept that humans are born cast out of paradise and babies are monsters from the moment they come out of their womb, the mothers. The most appalling thing is simulation theory. In fact, simulation theory has been created by transhumanists and AI evangelicals, evangelical types in order to replace original sin. Simulation theory is about imprisonment. It's, a be, it's, it's that Gnostic concept that the earth is a gigantic prison and the only way out is debt. Switching off the program. And so I, I was talking to some chap the other day about it and he says, no, no, chaos magic can smash the simulation. I says, no, but according to simulation theory, I'm talking about the actual theory itself as proposed by the, the original people who described it, who are enforcing it. Even when you say, I'm going to bust the simulation over, that is a protocol of programming that has been written into the script for you to think that in order for the simulation to stop you. So these people in the alternative who are falling for the simulation theory either get your terminology right or run a mile from it because you're involved in something you either don't understand and it's extremely dangerous. And simulation theory is easily debunked. That's another thing. It's purely a theological or a theocrat, a technocratic or arbitrary idea that you're supposed to believe a convention how is it how is it done it'd be the double slit experiment the early school the early copenhagen school the observer effect we look at something it changes format we're not looking at it, it disappears simple as that it's created by observation if the simulation theory was correct we wouldn't have magic we wouldn't be have genuine ability to hack the universe. We wouldn't, and we we've all done it. I've done it. You've done it. That would not exist under simulation theory. No hacking would be allowed, uh, the, because the even the impetus to hack would be controlled. So you would deliberately fail and deliberately fail to believe that you have no future. You are predestined, just like you have in Campbell, Cal, Calvinism and Lutherism. But because magic works in this reality, that proves a simulation. Theory is wrong. I'll give you an example, personal example. I think I've told you the story that when I was living on the South Circular Road in Dublin for a couple of years in the early two thousands, I was living in this this the early Victorian brown brown uh, brownstone. It was straight out of Arkham, straight out of like Jack the Ripper's East End London, and uh, I it, it, it wasn't a particularly happy time, but I was actually. I was I enjoyed that element of it, but I had to change my life to get out of the the this the the uh, the working money rut that I was stuck in. Things were not going well for me. I was playing the game to get some money, but again, playing the game wasn't working for me. But I badly needed some money to pay for some medical bills. So I'm walking around the streets of this part of Dublin. South Circular Road, Portobello. Now, Portobello used to be a big Jewish area, and the Kabbalah was heavily practiced there. So there was that element of that too. It's very much Joycean's Dublin, that kind of night town vibe. Uh, there's all different kinds of people live there. It's basically 24 hours a day. It gets very, gets, you know, it gets, there's, there's always someone on the streets, at, and even at 3 or 4 in the morning. And uh, which is typical of Dublin anyway. But it's like. Uh, it it felt like living in in early Victorian times. I felt like I was living in old Europe, and that's that was the vibe. And I was bored a lot of the time in the evenings because I didn't have a lot to do after work, and uh, I'd be reading. I was you know reading books as one. You like eventually get tired of that. And I used to go to like you know lectures at the National Gallery, and but I wanted to do something on my own, and and so I I went into psychogeographic exploring just walking around the streets seeing where it would take me and uh, at late late at night and not see it's not psychogeography in the marxist sense that you're seeing like economic differences between communities but in the sort of like it, more like a kind of a, a a you know a geomancy kind of way to see what would like unleash itself before me so i used to walk up and down all around the side streets streets you know and explore them 
and you would bump into the strangest characters or you'd meet the sometimes quite frightening individuals and it's often women often a blonde woman often the most frightening person that gave me the creeps might be a blonde thin woman it's almost like the the demon avatar that's been created to come after me in my life and damage me on behalf of the abyss as a blonde woman it's 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 i'm not maybe a blonde woman listen to this i'm not saying you were uh, you were that but like you know that you i did the 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 gods have often warned me using them as almost like uh, alarm bells stay away from these types and this might be a casual conversation at a bus stop that kind of thing you know or just you know walking you know going into a pub and women start talking to you and it's suddenly getting i don't want to be around this person and they were always a blonde woman i don't know why and um uh, that's 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 the symbolism and uh, there's a there's a, a, a nastiness there a bdsm viciousness there that was quite apparent and uh so i started to say i'm going to walk differently home from work today so instead of walking because i could walk to work and back walking along the street i'm going to walk diagonally between lampposts so i would walk to the next lamppost diagonally across the street to the other side the, the, the other side of the road walk down a couple of lampposts diagonally across the street to the other side of the road now this was part of a chaos magic working i started to develop around the same time based on lampposts funny enough this began with me buying you know those green army men soldiers i wanted to you know i wanted to hack reality at some level i've often do this now and again now i can do it on the internet but i can do it in real life now and again so do you remember those green army men soldiers you could buy like a bag of 50 of them in a, in a discount shop well I, I bought like a hundred of them and put cheap magnets on them powerful skinny cheap magnets on them and the lampposts i discovered were old tram poles they're quite ornate and they're all along the south circular road and they're made of cast iron so they're magnetic and so just for the hell of it I, paint, I spray painted a hundred and fluorescent pink and a hundred and fluorescent yellow. And I think I did this because it was around the time of the Gulf War following 9-11. And there was like so much things about, you know, the Gulf War and the, the NATO going in to attack Osama Dame. So I, that, that's why I think I did it. That's why it, it I, I went down that road. And I threw these, uh, I've, if you heard me tell the story before, I apologize, maybe some of you haven't. So about three o'clock in the morning, I went up, down, up and down the street now and again, and I would throw them as far up into the, the lamppost, some of them up 20 feet off the ground, until the magnet hit the, the metal and stuck. So at random places all along the South Circular Road, and they're probably there to this day, but either the glue has failed on the magnet or connected to the toy soldier. I even remember it was that Yoo-Hoo yellow glue that comes in a tube, and, um, or the paint is washed off. But the magnets would probably be still there. And so there was yellow and pink green army men all along these lampposts all along the South Circular Road. Just so, just to hack reality. And people say, what's the point of that? Well, you've created novelty. And when you create novelty in the Matrix, you create a change. So, for instance, someone's walking down the street and they go, what the hell is that pink thing up there? And they take a closer look. It's a toy soldier painted fluorescent pink and yellow. What's that about? And then they walk down a few more lampposts and they say they see it. Then they go into a shop and they say to Abdul behind the counter, Abdul, did you see the did you see the yellow yellow and pink soldiers stuck on the lampposts? And they go, Yeah, yeah, what's that about? I don't know. I don't know. It's a bit weird now, yeah. You've 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 hacked reality there. Because you've created novelty in the universe. So you've created a sense of puzzlement puzzling people <laughs> within these uh, individuals and suddenly uh, that's it you know like this has been done lots of times a a a, a, a black car that was windows were all painted black parked at the crossroads somewhere it can create terror a white fan just driving around a community with nothing negative about it has been known to cause terror what you're doing is you're creating a, you're bringing novelty into reality and you're creating a reaction now this is what's happening with this novelty and reaction is that you're you've, you've you've made the universe malleable therefore you're aware 
that you can get into other people's heads that you can then alter their their behavior and this is magic now you're not doing it a black magic way where you're forcing it you're creating novelty and they're observing the novelty you're not forcing the novelty upon them you're not locking them in a room and showing them little sta- pig, little green green little yellow and pink fluorescent green army men there you're casually putting them on a lamppost and they're noticing them reality has been altered and they become a kind of a sigil so i turned a section of the south circular road from Ratmines Road, Portobello, all the way down to Dolphin's Barn into a basically a magic circle that I was playing with. And between the diagonal walking, changing my walking routine, this thing with the pink and green, pink and yellow arm, green army men stuck to the lamppost, and doing other things, making little stickers that had irrelevant shapes on them, sigils, but they didn't have any meaning. And sticking them on walls and places like that, and lampposts, and the, for people to see and go, what is that? I had turned that whole section of the city into my own magic circle. And then something remarkable happened. All the problems in my life started fixing themselves out. Why? Because I, and then, and actually got a lot better. A lot of things rapidly improved and things that I was I wanted to experience and desire and doors opening to me that had no relevance no relevance at all to what I had done suddenly happened so if I wanted to visit a certain country and didn't have the means or the money suddenly someone say to me there's a conference on in this city you, you, would you like to go to it I paid expenses because I had disrupted uh, the negative elements in my own reality I had caused a change in the material world and that was the that was the purest essence of the biggest magical working I've ever done I think in terms of chaos I altered the reality of an entire street. And you should be doing the same too. If you're any way interested in the occult, you should be doing similar things. In your, If you want to get out of a rut in life, you should be doing similar things. Disrupting the reality of where you live. In fact, if we all did this tribe, we would disrupt the machinations of the pathological psychopathic control grid, the Western civilization destroyers. This is why... If you want to change reality, following the river, running for elections, going on Main Street, it's not going to work. Solving the problems in your own life, going along to get along, is not going to work. But if you disrupt the observational effects of the quantum field around you, this takes the disruption within you and transfers it outside of you into a chaos working you will find that the inhibitors that were stopping you from attaining what you needed to desire for your will are then available to you because you removed the inhibitors into a chaos field i'm actually thinking of writing a book about this into much greater depth and almost like a, a, a guidebook but i don't know if i will or not but i'm kind of you know I, I like you know we'll see spoken word sometimes is just as good but maybe it might be at some point down the road i'll write a book about this basically you know a reality survival manual and and fundamental to this fundamental to all this is the demarcation that i had taken the south circular road i'd be walking home from work to my apartment well it was basically just a flat and an old it it was like it might as well have been arkham and and the 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 lovecraftian thing and i i'd walk down that road unhappy every day even when the weather was beautiful things were working in terms of what i was trying to achieve in the matrix but not my dharma was not being filled fulfilled so instead i turned the whole road that i walked along every day into a magic circle first by well at the same time i did a walking in 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 
by creating novelty, first by walking up and down the road in different ways every day, not taking the same steps and the same path and the same thing, walking different roads. Secondly, by creating that distract that psychic distraction of the green army men painted fluorescent pink and yellow and the stickers on the wall and other little bits and pieces it threw the trajectory out that was impacting upon me and moved me towards the bank of the river and the key to all that was taking the control space that was within me and expanding it out to the whole length of that part of the south circular road turning it into my magic circle my magical space my temple and disrupting the reality for the thousands and thousands of people that live along that road and then the cars passing through it and making them subject to my will by observation and not by force you see it's not the same thing as putting them in a room against their will and showing it to them their choice to look at this thing the npcs will look at the novelty they will observe the novelty and they won't they won't think about it twice oh green Ar- green army men painted front for it go on listening to the radio the ones who are sent you would go what the fuck is that that's a bit weird it must be some kind of art thing now this is why i understand where marina abramovich is coming from and i, I can suddenly i can suddenly see a million spliffs cascading out of the lips of every truth are listening to this right now you know but but that's what she's doing it's shamanic the level she has taken it to the reason why she's so famous today and moves in circles of power is not because she was born at the illuminati or because she had any great help growing up it was because of those early those 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 early workings those early performance art things like rest energy like the one where her partner held the bow and he just had to let go of it and she was instantly killed that was a chaos magic ritual that's why she went from being a girl who was trapped by her overbearing mother who wouldn't even let her go and date boys when she was in her 20s into one of the most famous people in the world because she created novelty it's why we remember Picasso and Samuel Beckett and James Joyce and we don't remember artists who continued the previous artistic traditions in both literary and painting, illustration, art, theatre because they didn't create novelty. They were continuing on the sound the centre of the river. It doesn't matter how proficient their art was. No one's denying that. No one is saying you are not a staggeringly amazing painting. But hey, what the hell is this Francis Bacon a paint painting about? Boom, Francis Bacon's name suddenly charged. Boom, novelty and active. Boom, he's a legend. The guy who paints a perfect sunset over Canterbury that's staggeringly done to the level of Canaletto or Turner. You go, that's beautiful, but you don't remember their name. But you remember Francis Bacon. Novelty, my friends novelty and controlling the space controlling the space and novelty is what gets you out of a rut it doesn't matter if you how young you are although it's much better if you learn this lesson when you're younger because you can actually help affect your life in many ways but it's but don't never go along to get along create novelty and swim diagonally and also don't allow yourself to be captured by someone else's sorcery in a in a confined space so for instance i created that space on on the uh, the, the south circular road knowing it was temporary because it i was not it only i only needed it as long as it was a, as long as it was working and once it worked let it fall apart so like i said the paint washed off the green army men the glue decayed and it's all gone now the paper stickers on the lamp posts with the strange designs on them they all melt washed away in the rain 
I'm no longer walking diagonally along the lampposts. So that that space was cleared. It's the same thing as closing a magic circle, a magic ritual, I mean. So if you, you know, we all know what happened with Crowley at Loch Ness and the monster. The Abanelum the mage wasn't closed. And the same thing can happen if a sorcerer has built a magical space and hasn't shut it down. And then they die or something happens. And then this, their magic continues on. It hasn't been, the, the actual ritual space, if it was written in salt or sand or paint, it hasn't been washed off the floor. It remains and those who step into it are still spellbound by it. So you always have to be careful. Am I being affected by the magical workings of someone afterwards? I, there's a lot of things, a lot of stories that if you get secondhand magic books, that you could be affected by them. The previous spells that were used in Conjurers, that's not true at all. They're just pages with ink on them, just like tarot cards or cards with paintings on them. It, it They're not directly bonded anymore to them. But where it could be tricky is, say, if you bought a house that belonged to an occultist, you moved in there. Like the Boleskin house thing is a classic example. And you still have the residual elements of that there that might affect you. A lot of haunted houses, old buildings, are ones where magic either but passively or actively has taken place. And the residual energies are still there because the person involved in it died or didn't close down the ritual or didn't change the thing. And this is where things like space and geometry and shapes are very, very important. You know, it's like the whole thing. How do you? One of the easiest ways to escape in a course is to change your name, uh, because that's literally you change your name and identity, or move, emigrate, and begin a new life, because you're, you're heading diagonally towards the bank. You're no longer in the, in the central path. But it's also if you move into a new place and you suddenly feel there might be residual energies. Many people confuse them with ghosts. A lot of times, they're actually entities and demons. Like, I stayed in a place in Wales not too long ago, and there was a shadow entity living in the underneath a balcony's parapet. And it was so obviously there. It was the poor thing was trapped, probably trapped. And it was probably because of some magical work, and it maybe could have taken place back in Druid times. We don't know. But it was there under the parapet of this balcony. And I was looking at it all night long. It didn't change, it didn't move, but it was there. And so it was the shadow entity. So that. So, you know, how would you get rid of that? Well, you knock down the balcony. So the same thing, if you move into a house, like an Amityville-type house, and you, you think you think that uh, it might be haunted, H-A-U-N-T-E-D in quotations, just by rebuilding the interior, you can actually stop all that. In fact, that's what happened to the Amityville house. The Amityville house, when I went to visit it in the first time in the 80s, and I told you this experience, it was mental. My, my friend Jerry and another friend went down there, and it was at the end of South Ireland Place in Sheridan Street, which was, which was bizarre anyway. And uh, there was the house, right? And we asked this man, can we see the house? And he goes, no, because there's a family living in there, and they're not happy. And, and I said, okay, look, we just came from Ireland. We don't mean anything. He said, okay, for Irish friends, there's a second house on the left. But don't knock on the door, don't do it. And I said, of course we won't. And funny enough, I saw a documentary months later and they were interviewing that house flat that we saw that we encountered on the street and he was saying, you know, we have people from all over the world. England, Ireland, Germany, they all want to see the house. He was talking about us. There was a magical work and we stepped we, we created a little chaos down by wanting to do that. But the house still looked like it looked like in the film. And when the you know, you had the De Mateo murders. And uh the the Lutz family. And then a new family moved in and they completely rebuilt the house. And that house does have... So even if Lutz are a bunch of phonies, that that really did happen there. Some, that place has something going on with it. You all heard me talking to Heather on the symposium. And she her parents lived next door up the street from that house. And there, it was very weird it went on with Ron DeFeo and the rest of the family there. And... Uh, not the Mayo, DeFeo, sorry. And... Uh, Anyway, I think there was some kind of uh, DARPA thing going on with all that. And uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory and experiments with like MKUltra kind of things. But that's a different story. But anyway, the family changed the house 
they took the windows that they gave it that face at the front and at the end of the film get out and it looks like the face is the face of the house is saying it they changed the dutch colonial style facade well that's how you do it you move into a new place that has a house that you think might be haunted quotations it might be left over residual energies from magical workings in the past and it may be going back thousands of years is to change the the interior so rebuild the walls rebuild the layout of the house and then you'll that will that will that will solve the problem in every case a hundred percent a hundred percent and uh, you've, you've dealt with that problem but if you continue to live in the house without making alterations it will get much worse see this is one of the things that made me we've all seen my 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 documentary lever providence on hp lovecraft the real necronomicon and why i absolutely am convinced that lovecraft was a real occultist a hundred percent he may have written essays ca- called the cancer superstition with the likes of harry houdini who you know he may have slagged the whole thing off and said it was it was all nonsense and slagged the life of crowley off and all these other people oh but he believed it because that's what happened to him when he was younger and his you know remember his his grandfather whipple had a vast library of esoteric books he was one of the most powerful freemasons in new england he opened lodges everywhere and uh, there's no way you can read lovecraft and come away thinking this guy doesn't know anything about the occult first hand he, he, he is ground zero if you, for many of us to learn about the occult if you don't know anything just in his fiction you know the other two subjects he spoke very strongly about in a lot of his books were astronomy which remember the first ever published thing he ever did was astronomy and also the occult in depth in depth now where was i leading with this oh yeah what was i saying the old houses when you move into an old house so one of the things that conf- conf- you know completely got me believing that that lovecraft was a real occultist who may we may have tried it and stopped it after it messed him up was one of his stories called the dreams in the witch house which is from 1932 and is part of his Cthulhu mythos. In that story, there's a guy called Walter Gilman, who is a univers is a graduate of the University of Miskatonic, and he's interested in both folklore and mathematics, particularly theoretical physics and advanced mathematics. And he rents an attic in a rundown part of Arkham. In an old part of the city that's you know goes back to colonial times and maybe before and the apartment ethic was just like the one that i rented on the south circular road and it was known colloquially as the witch room and a a, a witch called kaziah manson had been arrested for doing sorcery back in colonial times inside this apartment building in arkman in the room where Walter Gilman had rented it and while in prison she had mysteriously vanished and Gilman being a concept being a a mathematician and but interest in folklore wanted to rent the room even though it had a heart a dark history of numerous suicides uh, of people who'd lived there and one of the first things he noticed was it had an unearthly geometry now here we go this is very interesting this is why we have demarcated specific spaces within magic why specifics have why sigils have specific geometric designs you know absolutely you never see a sigil that's all squidgly lines all over the place even when it seems like that it's it's strongly demarcated with inside a circle or some other say shape like a an eight pointed star or a you know like the sigillium of uh, John D. It always has to be demarcated, just like an electrical circuit board holds the psychic energy within the components and of the PCB, the printed circuit. The sigil or the magical seal or even the magical space is strongly held within the demarcation 
of this what they call rigid geometry classic you know calculus type geometry Euclidean geometry now Lovecraft living in these times would have been well aware this is not long after the Copenhagen experiment which we spoke about earlier on and the concept that the reality is not reductionist and rigid it is as we experience it and that's how we hold it together but beyond that it isn't and this guy Walter Gilman suddenly realized that these this unearthly geometry this non-euclidean geometry of how the room was meant was changing a psychic state you know these places they have at fairgrounds where you stand two people at the same height stand in a room and the way the room is shaped it looks like one person's a giant or one person's tiny but they're the same size depending on where they sit in the room and the way it's painted that kind of stuff these these tricks of these visual tricks well what they do is they flip you out of your own rigid consciousness but they have a dangerous if, if you know how to use them you can travel through space and time this was done within groups like the the golden dawn they would disappear into a seal on a wall into a sigil the that's this the legend that's what Mulcrab is implying to happen to Keziah Manson when she was in prison jump through the when they're uh, it jumped through the loop so this interdimensional travel this non euclidean spaces this strangeness the geometric structure that allows us to contain forces is broken up and is moved outside the the rigid structure we've lost control of it so it, it, non euclidean geometry is was basically used to describe quantum physics and things like there being dimensions beyond the third dimension and very interesting stuff prior to the invention of computers before the 1960s and 70s it was done with you know rulers and you know protractors and compasses and drawn with pens and pencils to create these shapes in fact there was a an artistic movement in theosophy at the beginning of the 20th century of trying to paint non-reality in paintings in order to explain the spirit world outside rigid geometry thinkings because that's where that is beyond where we are is in the world of non-Euclidean geometry and it's in the world of 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 uh, the abyss we can't understand this is why they become obsessed with now building a, a new particle collider that's even bigger than the one because they're being lured deeper into the abyss and as they're being lured deeper into the abyss by the searching for their god particles the reality of the planet is deteriorating at a rapid pace in fact Morgoth said something recently that was bang on the money and one of the best quotes I've heard in years he says as the AI world becomes more real the real world deteriorates accordingly in in kind is bang on that's what's happening this is where these geeks are taking us these geeks are, are playing with magic they don't understand it's magic but Lovecraft absolutely did and that's what happened this is why the character of brown jenkins this weird rat type creature this is where a lot of comes in and out of the apartment in, in gilman's apartment in the witch house this is be, this is because it comes these the, the they're not of their beings of another world they're from beyond like the other lovecraft thing they're from beyond and when you lose the rigidity of the demarcation line and you're not in control of it if you're in control of it you control the space but if you're stuck in someone else's space you have no control of it and not only does it affect you in your psychological and mental state and this is where this is why the world is all like gaslight gaslighting is a kind of black magic well, as i'd mentioned in there um, both puzzling people and defeated demons but where this this goes on at this level in society is where you you can see we're being drawn ai is drawing us into non-euclidean geometry non-euclidean thinking where the rigidity of reality is falling apart and suddenly men can breastfeed and things like that and that, this nonsense and this is all part of the collapse of reality and those of us who are not who are able to see this are not falling into it uh, because we're aware that ultimately what we call a spiritual battle is unfolding 
and were being taken into a non-Euclidean reality. And that's what the story of the Dreams in the Witch House, Witch House about Lovecraft is. The world that we live in today where is the Walter Gilmans and the Normies and the NPC is being ripped asunder by going along to get along. Where well, the rest of us have to be like the witch, Keziah, and disappear through the wall. And this is where a lot of a lot of um, interdimensional creatures, what they call cryptozoology, uh, Mothman. Remember, the Mothman appeared all around Chernobyl when that happened, and um, that was a break in reality because of all the you know the atomic stuff that went on, and uh, mistakes and so on, and all the psychic fear poured into it, and strange, strange, strange experience happened around those kinds of things. We can either be spellbound or we can learn to control it. And this is why, you know, things like the Black Cube, a lot of nonsense about the Black Cube, the Saturn, that's all made of bollocks. But yet the whole Black Cube thing, the the it, the innocuous nature of the shape, it draws people in, like iron filings around a magnet. They don't know what it means, but it spells spells them, and it's enough to change them. That's why you have all these things appearing all th- during this pandemic. Nothing to do with aliens, it's to do with gaslighting people, to gaslighting the sheeple. And that's why they have that black box abyss where 9-11 Ground Zero happened. And recently there was an awful video of a man with his stomach all slashed falling into that. He was just, he was telling us in his own broken Renfield way, poor guy, what that thing is really about. But that's what The Dreams in the Witch House by Lovecraft is the world today. It's not just happening in this one apartment, it's happening in the entire planet. And a lot of this has to do with the demarcation line, but also the inability to accept correspondences. Now, correspondences is in a part of magic. It's mostly, and the occult, it's mostly common, common within Kabbalism. And correspondences are one thing having a balance to another. So remember at the beginning of this, I said the left bank, the right bank. You know, this kind of thing, up, down, as above, so below. When you understand the nature of correspondences, you understand the nature of the demarcations that will allow you to find a path to move through, whatever way you want. So correspondences are the idea that one force is balanced out by another. So it's kind of like Neoplatonism. You know, good, bad, good and evil, yin-yang, all that kind of stuff. Recently I did a jokey kind of artwork, but it wasn't really, called Irish Tantra. Tantra. And I put a picture of, uh, what's that woman's name? Bambi Thug inside the yin and yang thing beside uh, Enoch Burke. You know, that was a classic example of correspondences. In fact, one of the reasons you've got to be careful with sigils, other people's sigils, and this is what always gets me about them, you know, say the Lesser Key of Solomon, and you have all the sigils, the the, the later published versions, and you have like the sigils pertaining to certain uh, entities, they call them demons, that will allow certain powers to manifest. I often wondered if there, how many of them are traps, and how many people who put this stuff in their books are traps. Well, because there's often no correspondence image to these things. Now, what would be the corresponding image to a sigil? It's reflection in a mirror. And I often wonder how many seals and sigils... That's why I don't use other people's seals and sigils. Now, some of them it would make no difference within a corresponding reflection. Jeez, I'm giving you some deep stuff to... You know, I, hope, I, hope not, I hope I'm not... Oh, I'm boring you, overwhelming you, but I'm giving you, like... This is what I know, okay? This is, you know, 40-odd years of stuff. Is that, like, say, a pentagram, a pentacle, a five-pointed, eight-pointed star. They, in terms of correspondent reflections, are always the same. So you, you, you draw one on a wall, and you hold a mirror up to, a, say, a pentagram. It's still a pentagram. You know, it's correspondent, it's identical. That's, why, that's half the reason that these shapes are so powerful and prevalent in magic. However, if you draw a sigil, say devoted to a certain entity and that was meant to be resolved as a correspondent reflection you could be invoking the deadly side of something you probably the real sigil is probably its correspondent reflection in a mirror so always think about that this is why 
always make your own sigils and don't use other people's sigils. That's why thing you use things like the 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 seals and the sigils were inside the lesser key of Solomon as guidelines and not as actual things. And there are things that you that would be okay that would that would like that, that the helm of awe should be okay. Maybe not. Again, I would be very careful about this, you know. Uh, again, do, do, you're better off this. That's why I've developed my own sigil, a couple of them, and I use them. And I, they've, they're actually done in correspondences in mirrors, and um, and my, you know, the altar of the altar of everything and nothing sigil on my chaos paganism page and my Substack, that kind of thing, and bring them down to simplicity as much as possible. Let's talk a bit. Let's talk about a bit more about the esoteric history of correspondences because it's kind of interesting. Now, regarding the system of correspondences, or Cavendish in his book *The Black Arts*, came out in the late sixties, wrote extensively on this. These are one of these, you know, occult books that came out back in the days that were actually surprisingly in depth and he lays out the the system of correspondences or the laws of correspondences very clearly you know the idea that a link which connects the items on a list together is the fact that they are all associated with the sun in ritual magic and he lists the lion the sparrow hawk and the phoenix the color yellow and the number six the god Apollo, a child, the zodiac sign of Leo, Clo, Cinnamons and Mir, a cock, a scepter, a link which connects the items on the list together. Now the most familiar correspondences are those between the days of the weeks and the planetary gods, which are all familiar with. You know, know Sunday is the day of the sun, Monday is the day of the moon and so on. And European magicians have always used this set of links as a guide to the best time for performing different types of magical operations. So the concept of Thor, Thursday, a thunderstorm would be a very good day to do a magical working. So if you're having a thunderstorm on a Thursday, that's a very good day of the week for a European occultist to develop a charge. Obviously so. The theatrical elements are brought together by the thunderstorm not to mention it's Thor's day. Now in the Key of Solomon it says that Sunday is the day of the sun or one of the traditional hours of the sun and it's the right time for a ritual intended to gain money or attract support of influential people. Success. This is why the sun card in the right away tarot has the child on a horse it's um, the the Sunday has been very made very dark by Abrahamics. This is why Sunday is a day of rest at home and reading scripture. If you know among say dark Presbyterian type religions, in reality it's a day to make your dreams come true. In the pagan times and in the magical times, and this is why the Abrahamics made Sunday the day, the Lord's day, not your day, the Lord's day, the day of rest. And an occultist performing a ceremony for this purpose on a Sunday would have used things which corresponded to the sun as best he could. He would light six candles on his altar. He would wear a gold ring on his finger. And he will drape the room in what he sees as working with yellow hangings. You know, like yellow, you know, furniture hangings and those, you know, those yellow shawls. They might even paint the room yellow. And lots of hexagrams and six-pointed stars associated with the sun. In traditional occultism within the Key of Solomon. And you will burn incenses such as cinnamon and myrrh. If you want to be more hardcore, you'll sacrifice a black cockle. And the occultist would have used these things, he believed. that, that That's why we eat chicken on a Sunday, you know that. The reason why we eat chicken on a Sunday is a sacrifice cockle. That's where that came from. The cockle would be sacrificed and used as a, a ritual in Sol Invictus. And that's why we have traditionally have you know roast chicken on Sundays. 
So he's linking the powerful force or current of energy operating in the universe, i.e. the sun, with that which attracts the force here in the real world or on earth and to bear it on the object of the ceremony. So when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Now, this is part of one of the basic beliefs underlying European occultism. This conviction that the universe is not a disorderly collection of stray bits and pieces, but an ordered whole, a design, or a pattern. Hence, you know, astrology, and why so many people have given their lives to it. So that is a very, even though astrology has its roots in the, you know, the, the Asiatic world, it's, it's, if you were to say that there was one form of occultism that's truly European, well, two really, but they are interlinked, is the, astro- is the astrology and the, the tarot. These can be seen, these patterns or connections are like the magical equivalent of a scientist's classification of a phenomenon. And he studies them in ordinary groups and then goes back and attempts to make sense of the world by classifying things in terms of the gods who controlled them. This was central to paganism, classical paganism. This is why pagan temples were always devoted to a singular god or goddess. That's the theory that the pantheon was surrounded by all the gods simply isn't true. The reason for this would be something like if there was an earthquake and the temple of Apollo was destroyed, or if there was a lightning strike and the temple of Athena was destroyed, we would know that 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 god was directly, and what that god represented was directly angered. Modern occultists, they kind of substitute these gods for mysterious forces or currents. And they both work, and in the universe, inside and outside of themselves as forces. Many of the correspondences are drawn from the ancient world, and they're based on any on principles known to science, but on no, they're not they're not based on science. They are scientific in how they're approached, but they're actually based on symbolic poetic logic, which is a a much more better software for decoding reality, and links these things together outwardly and rationally, and they do not appear to be connected in that sense, but they are symbolically and ritually. So you take the dove and the sparrow. And they correspond to the planet Venus, the goddess Venus, the force of love. And just as they were sacred to Aphrodite in Greece, because they are notably amorous birds. They're very lovey-dovey birds. So the lovey-dovey bird is connected to Venus. So again, you have the planets and metals and colors as another way of making these symbols or rites of correspondences. The connection between planets have a certain logic to them when you think about them. So the sun is connected to gold, obviously, and the color, well, yellow. The moon is connected to silver and the colors white. Mercury is connected to quicksilver or mercury and the color is gray. Venus is connected to copper and the color is green. Mars is connected to iron and the color is red obviously and Jupiter to tin and it's blue and Saturn is connected to lead and it's black. Now, gold and silver belong to the sun, respectively, partly because of their colour and partly because it was natural to connect it to most valuable metals and most valuable planets. Now, I want to go back to the Saturn thing again. There's a big thing among the troopers of the Saturnalian cult connected to the black cube. It's not the cube is not the cube as in the Abrahamics connected to. The, the Saturn is nonsense, and they've, they go to extreme lengths to say that the, the hexagram on the top of Saturn is a rotated cube. That they, The ancients didn't know about that. It's the black part, the colour black. That's why the colour black, not the cube itself, but the colour black. The black cube absolutely is ritualistic, but it's not connected to Saturn. The colour black is connected to Saturn, and it's coloured. That's why the Abrahamics were black. The burqa, the priest, the nun... The rabbi, the iman, they dress in black. The sun's link with gold is the key of Solomon's recommendation for Sunday, so that makes perfect sense, and for a magical operation to make money. Think about it. Money, sun, affluence, power. What is the source of all life? The sun. Quicksilver, or the, the, the metal mercury, belongs to the planet mercury because it's the most mobile of the metals, and mercury is the fasting moving planet. 
because mercury metal flows like a liquid. Green being the colour of Venus or Aphrodite is the ruler of nature. And copper goes green when it's exposed to air and water. The force behind the green growth of vegetation and copper is probably her metal because Cyprus as both a place and Aphrodite's birth, the country of Cyprus, the island of Cyprus, and also the classical world's principal source of copper. How interesting is that? There's also very good theories about the green man and copper. And the the the, gold, the colour green having a far more symbolic connection to copper than, say, vegetation. And most of Northern Europeans' understanding of the colour copper, sorry, the colour green connected to, say, the green man and the, and the woodlands, is really a post-Romanish thing that we may have adopted from copper being connected to Aphrodite or Venus. Now, you know, iron, that's obviously the metal of Mars because of it's used in weapons of war. Well, back then it was, and still is, actually. And red is the colour of blood and bloodshed. And you see, it all does link. There's a, there's a real logic there. Also, the planet Mars sometimes has a reddish look in the sky. When you, Absolutely, it does more so than ever. Blue belongs to Jupiter as the lord of the sky, but his connection with tin is obscure, though very, very old, and it comes from the Sumerian name for tin, which was called the metal of heaven, Le- so, and that was connected directly to Jupiter, their, their, their planetary understanding of Jupiter, the metal of heaven. Lead, the darkest and heaviest of the metals, and black as the colour of death, were naturally associated with Saturn, and the dimmest and slowest moving of the planets that we could see with our naked eye. It was the furthest away and the nearest to darkness, and the slowest moving. That's why Saturn became connected to debt. Well, debt in not this sort of like debt final you know final sense but this cycle of life that you you know that the the secular nature of saturn was represented of the life and death cycle and that's why it was f- the dimmest of all the planets being the furthest from the earth and the closest to the abyss in the symbolic ancient sense this is before the discovery of uranus neptune and pluto the same type of thinking lies behind other sun correspondences listed like I've mentioned, like the cock, for example, because it greets the sun at dawn, and the sparrow hawk because it soars towards the sun. And plants like cloves and cinnamon, or herbs, they correspond to the sun as the preserver and sustainer of life on earth, because cinnamon and cloves both preserve food and are used for that reason. And they have, because they have, they have these bacterial killing properties inside them. Mir is also preserved of use, well, was by the Egyptians, in embalming corpses, which is kind of weird how they brought that to, to baby Jesus. You know, if you want to go to that, biblical symbol, symbolic stuff. And is offered to the midday Egyptian sun god. Now, a cultist who worked within the Kabbalah, and we're talking about from the 1200s in the south of France on, their correspondence is not only the planets, but the ten sephira. See, they were creating a demarcation software now in order to encapsulate them. You see, even the Kabbalists realize that although these things came from antiquity and pagan, there's a lot to actually say that the Kabbalah came from paganism, an awful lot. You know, it was like the, the, the Jewish mystics in the south of France being influenced by the world down there, uh, the Cathars and all the other mystical elements down there. Don't forget, I have a new book out on with Neil MacDonald uh, regarding the Renaissance mystery. And in, in order to structuralize it and so it's safer to work with, they created the Kabbalah. And so, therefore, they use correspondences with the Sephiroth. And you've seen the Tree of Life and the aspects of God and the Divine Being in the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. And you also know there are 22 paths which link the Sephiroth together on that, that Tree of Life. And to the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, you see, it doesn't matter what you use, even if you're not Jewish. It, it, it's a handy framework to operate in. This is why a Jewish person can use, you know, Nordic magic if they, you know, go by the ritualistic rites. And, so, and then a person of Northern European origin can use the Kabbalah. It's just, it's just a type of software. It's like C Basic and, you know, Fortran, the old computer programming languages they still achieve the same thing 
Now, the 22 major trumps of the tarot pack, I mentioned that, tarot, Kabbalah, and a detailed system of Kabbalistic correspondence uh, was created by yeah, our old friend Alistair Crowley in his book Magic and Theory and Practice, which um, he laid this. He actually lays it out beautifully in that. All the troopers read that. It's like that book has like you know, it's it's all about satanic uh, but it's really like one. Of, it's still one of the best uh, treaties on magic ever. And so that whole uh, concept is based on Crowley's work, and that with his enemy McGregor's well, his later enemy McGregor's matters back in the old and golden dawn days. Now, one of the uses of this system of correspondences for up-and-coming occultists is a set of signposts on 22 paths, which you can rise through the spheres, almost, you know, these are initiation initiation steps, and climb towards God. Now, this is a hazardous undertaking, though, and you have to be careful because you can easily stray from the true way. See, this is why they call Kabbalah the truth path. Not that it's the only path, but it gives you a very safe framework to operate in. You know, you don't want to find yourself being ending up like Walter Gilman in the uh, the witch house. Now, the path to Malkuth up to Yasod, the first path which allows you, that allows you to travel, you must, or transverse, belongs to Saturn. And the, L, L, you know, the signals the significators of debt destruction are assigned to it and that includes the colour black and the yew tree and the cypress tree and that's why they're planted in graveyards they're, they're, they are, they are, the reason why the yew tree is in a, are in graveyards is because the yew tree is, is eternal it doesn't die when a yew tree falls over its branches continue to grow and it's a symbol of that debt is not the end the truthers with their whole black cult of Saturn thing think it's all about debt and everything you know Kronos is all about eating babies and stuff no it's about that when you die you are born again you are born to die in order that you live again it's about reincarnation if you're an occultist and you see a figure or a person dressed in red on a path or on a horse the horse is seen as the beast of Mars. And if you come across an almond tree, that belongs to the moon. And you know you're on the true path if you're looking for these specific correspondences towards what your will is. So if you were working towards the aspect of love in terms of Venus... And you were to see a flight of doves or sparrows or a swan. Then you know that you are involved with the creatures of Venus and so on. So like Diana would be like, you know, f- f- uh, deer and stuff like that. And that's what correspondences are. So to each and every thing, there is a correspondence between that which operates on the, in the heavens and that which operates on the earth. And creating specific archetypal proactive links between the pair of them is what generates the will within the material world and it's it makes perfect sense then so this is why our ancestors in pagan times would dress for different days of the week you still get that in the hindu world in the vedic world that there's different saris for different festivals or different times of the year to suggest different things these capture by means of correspondence the heavenly attributes of these uh, these forces which you can work through yourself. And that I came across that years ago in Cavendish's book, The Black Arts. I, I don't know if you can still get it online, but it's it was def- you know, it's it's got a sensationalist term, the black arts, but there's actually a lot of good occultic stuff inside it. And just to f- just to continue on, I want to talk a bit more about Kronos. You know, the very misunderstood god Kronos. Uh, you know, he, you know, we know he was chief among the Titans, the twelve former gods, according to Hesiod in seven hundred BC. The Titans were the children of heaven and earth, together with the Cyclops and the the hundred-handed monsters. But they were not able to reach the light until Cronus, the youngest Titan, castrated his father with a sickle, and so separated the heavens from the earth. And this has also been used as a kind of a compensatory what's the word 
the mythology understanding of the fall of ancient Greece. I, you've heard me talk about this in the past, whereby the gods that it existed within the landscape around the natural world, say Mount Olympus is a real place in Greece, the Elysium fields. I want to talk, actually, I've been meaning to talk about the Elysium rituals. We'll go on, or maybe later on the show we'll talk about that, uh, if I can stay awake. But the, yeah, the, so Arcadia being the classic one, you know, that Arcadia was a place here on earth. Okay, it, it's exactly a region of Greece. But because of this this separation of heaven and earth following Cronus, you know, and his act of castration removed the separation from earth and the gods departed from the groves, the woodlands, from Arcadia, from Mount Olympus and went to live in the heavens instead. And this separation was what caused the fall, it's been theorized, of ancient Greece. Now, that's seriously interesting stuff. And also, if you read the latest book, another shameless plug, by myself and Neil MacDonald, on Rennes La Chateau, I will talk about how, among the European royalty and elite, the concept of re-establishing Arcadia upon this earth has been a very central part to them. Now, with this separation, division between heaven and earth, a king of the gods, Cronus, married his sister, Rhea, and he bore him six children, Hestia, Demeter, Hera, Hades, Poseidon, and Zeus, you know all them. Earth and heaven had prophesied that one of the Cronus' children would overthrow him, and he tried to prevent this by swallowing them as they were born. This became a metaphor for life and death and trying to escape death. So Cronus ingesting his own children is very much relevant today in the, tran the, 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 the transhumanists and the billionaires who are terrified of death and are trying to upload their conscience to the... Nothing ever changes, really, does it? Upload their consciousness to the, to, to the cloud or inject themselves with the blood of young children and also adrenochrome, which you don't have to kill children to get. It's a very easy substance to formulate. So maybe in the old days they did it by hand, but they don't have to do it nowadays. It's a very simple pro simple uh, substance to synthesize. So... Rhea, the wife of, of Cronus, smuggled the last child away to Crete and delivering him to Cronus a swaddled stone which he duly swallowed, thinking it was the last child. Zeus grew up safely and somehow made Cronus regurgitate his other children after, and after a ten year w was between the older and younger gods. Zeus defeated Cronus and the other titans and fettered them were in Tartarus where they remain. It was formerly assumed that the myth reflected an historical displacement. I'm reading the the Reader's Digest here on Greek mythology, by the way. You don't have to go to esoteric books. Because uh, I don't want to make... I do know this stuff, but I know I'll make mistakes, so I just want to make sure I'm, I'm doing it correctly. So, uh, no doubt the prequel Cult of Cronus in the Hittite Tablets. However, they have revealed that a curiously similar story was current in Asia Minor around... Before 12,000 BC, the counterpart of Cronus is an, 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 an entity called Kumarbi, who becomes ruler of the gods by biting off and swallowing the gentles of heaven, a combination of the castration and swallowing motifs. As a result, Kumarbi conceives the sun, who becomes the weather god, the chief deity corresponding to the Greek Zeus. See, like Joseph Campbell, like he was right, they all are the same stories. Like Cronus, Kumbari wishes to destroy his offspring and probably swallows a stone in an attempt to ab at an abortion. The same action as in the Greek myth, but differently motivated. The attempts fail. The weather god is born. He fights a battle and emerges triumphant. You see, this is what I tried to do in the Druid Code, was to try and find similar counterpoints to all these myths to try and figure in what is the Irish creation myth. That's from Luther Vaughan. You'll enjoy that one too. It was probably in the period before 1200 BC that the Eastern conflicts were strong, that the Greeks took over a the you know Asia Minor and incorporated the Asiatic myths. 
Uh, you know, some of Alexander the Great and all that. And he should like to know what Coronis was before he had originally castrated and swallowed, and what he had swallowed had foisted upon him, and why he was chosen for that role. Possibly he was already the father of Zeus, although the name indicates non Greek origin and its interrelationship cannot go back to Indo European times. If he had a special function, they're probably obscure. And the Greeks themselves, well, you know, in that historical period, and their notions of the underworld, you know, it played no part in the world of men. Not until the arrival of the Dismanibus cult much later by the under the late Roman pagan empire. There, There is absolutely an alternative version, and it's quite interesting where it says, if I can remember, that Cronus's reign was actually a golden age, and he now rules over the fortunate hero in the Isles of the Blessed. It was Zeus's ascension, I think, that brought hardship and the necessity of tilling soil. Now, that's definitely a psycho-cultural rationalization surrounding the loss of Arcadia, the hunter-gatherer, the tranquility and abundance of nature, and having to do things like agriculture. It's amazing when you think about it, really, like how this, the history of humanity is, taught, is caught up and portrayed in all kinds of mythology. And this was connected to a feast called, well, might be, Corona, or the Feast of Corona celebrated in Athens and other towns around that part of Greece. Though its date different was different, differed in different places. It usually happened in May, harvest, and ploughing October. That's under the Greek calendar. And slaves were allowed to join their masters as mortals in merriment because they were still considered mortals. So Coronas, being a seasonal figure, played a part in the celebration. So the myth itself is really interesting. So you see, this is these missing parts of mythology, terribly interesting. These, you know, these, these, this, whole, you know, like the Irish creation myth. What, what is that really? Where, where do we find it? The same with the the anomaly surrounding Kronos. There's power not only in deciphering the missing parts of these mythologies, but also understanding that the missing parts of these mythologies. Them are powerful by virtue of them being missing. They affect consciousness in particular ways. You know, look at you look at Kronos and Saturn, right? Like the truth is going, Satanic, beautiful, Satanic, you know all this kind of thing, right? And that's why, because in in some mythologies, Kronos is heavily connected to child sacrifice. So adopts the form of a horse. In which he, in this legend, he adopts the form of a horse and he mates with a nymph, and became the father of the senator, Chiron. If I remember, yeah, it was Chiron. And at Olympia, on Cronus Hill, at the top of which, the priests known as the kings made an annual sacrifice to Cronus, around the time of the spring equinox where they would actually kill a child. This is how it goes. Now, Coronas Hill existed in the Lanconia in Greece and also in Sicily. Remember, Sicily was part of the Greek Empire. And the Carthaginian influence within Sicily is suspected that they may have led to the Phoenician concept of El or Moloch connected to child sacrifice. Now, this has tremendous, you know, extra-cultural, extra-historical, you know, resonance and echoes that goes on you you know the, the concept of la costa nostra and the mafia and how the mafia gangs in sicily would kill the, the oldest son or the sons of the rival gang so they wouldn't get them so you'd have like say a particular sicilian you see that on the godfather too how robert de niro's character got to america they were they would kill the the, the local don would kill this is what the Godfather films are much deeper than people realise they are. Well, I think people do realise they are, but they're very, very deep. So the 
the the act of La Costa Nostra and the killing of rival gang son is directly related to cor- coronic child sacrifice cults under the Carthaginian influence within Sicily on the cusp of that period of the the formation of the Greek Empire at Lanconia. Now, what makes this especially interesting? You see, we can't escape the Greeks. They're, this is why, if you're a European, this is why such a big deal is made. It doesn't matter if you're Northern European or anything. This is uh, this is the gestation pot, pot in which we all began. And, and, and it distillated through the Roman Empire into our own pagan pantheons and stories. So that even that there's this, I think it was Godfather three, or one I think it was where they go back to Italy, and I think uh, Sicily, and someone says to Al Pacino, you know, all this history, you know, is amazing. Why is there so much suffering? And Al Pacino goes, it's because it's in the history, and he's talking about right back to Carthaginian cult surrounding Molech and child sacrifice in Lanconia. Sorry, not not going to Sicily, and uh, Syracuse in Syracuse in Sicily. My mistake. Now the Romans themselves later they identified Cronus with their Satr- with their sat version of Saturn, for very different but equally superficial reasons. The Saturnalia, which was held at different, you know, it's Christmas basically, f- and the same character if a you know egalitarian merry making charity. That's what sacrifice really was giving money away to the poor, giving the slaves some time off, giving them some freedom and that's a very deep thing if you read um, Fraser's The Golden Bough, The King for a Day kind of thing, is a very deep not just in inter european but in all ancient societies and Cronus like all the main Greek gods was affected by his attempts at etymology and from the 5th century BC the obvious but false equation made him synonymous with chronos meaning time so that's actually but it's still real chronos in is connected to the word time but the god chronos through a, a sort of a a happenstance correspondence we're back to that again was linked with that it's actually wrong the allegory became real and then they conflated that with a swallowing of children time consumes all even your own progeny so that's why you see, like, this is why the 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 troopers on this, like, oh, it's satanic and all. They're, this is why they're profane because they're missing out on deeper truths here, deeper truths, and they're because they don't read any, they don't really read anything, you know. They don't they don't study anything. They're not capable of. They're they're like a truth NPCs. I'm I'm going on about them again, but I, I occasionally I'll get them showing up my wall, tell me, you know, you get you know like. You just listen to what this show has been so like so far, and that's like forty years of accumulation of reading and a, and a vast library, right? And then I'll have to deal with some come come on my wall who's seen a David Icke video or something about you know pop music is satanic, and then says to me, "Oh, when you're nearly there, you're nearly right. You don't really know what you're talking about." And that that's why I get infuriated because of these profane, you know ignoramuses thinking that they know it all because they've seen a, a five minute YouTube video made by a nut job, you know, Bible Belt Christian type psychosis but these darknesses are they're part of the game you know uh, they're part of the misunderstanding is part of the game as well the mistakes another reason is we proves we don't live in a simulation is that these mistakes happen these these misunderstandings of correspondences happen. These artificial generations of gods, such as Cronus, connect to time. And then you relate that back to things like the La Costa Nostra cults, Mafia of Sicily. And then you relate that further on to like the Godfather movies. As this is what I think the Zoroastrianism and Zoroaster, that, that became a very... A very big thing, you know, that's where, you know, the Satan idea came from. The opposing of reality, the Shaitan, as Muslims call them. The Zoroastrians was Araman. And there's a, there's, a, actually, let me see, I have it here, hold on. Yeah, the, the, Ar- the Aro, 
the, the Zarawastrian holy book is called the Gathas. I got a lot of this from Lewis Spencer's book, by the way. That's what the one I car- when I'm doing uh, Vaughn's and I, I suddenly jump onto the next tangent and I don't want to make a fool of myself by s- saying the wrong things. I'll pick up Lewis Spencer's book on the occult. But anyway, yeah, the Gathas. The Gathas is like the, the Zohar of the Zarawastrians. And let me just, oh, here's, and this is their creation myths. And this is why a lot of the stuff I have it and collected it over the years, I have posted bookmarks, you can hear them here, on the side of the books. And I put little notes on the side of the books so I can grab them real quick. And when I was, this is still, this is still, you know, tabulated from when I was working on the, the Druid Code. And I wanted, I was look desperately trying to find that on the Irish creation myth stuff, which I'm still working on. But this is from the, this is from the, the Gathas as relayed by Lewis Spence in like, about 120 years ago. In the beginning, those two spirits who are well endowed, twins were known as one God and the other evil, is in thought, word, and deed. Between them, the wise chose rightly, and not so the fools. And when these spirits met, they established in this uh, beginning of life and death that in the end of the followers of the lie should meet with the worst in existence, but the followers of the truth with the best mind. You know, this you can see where what you call it came from, uh, theosophy. Of these two spirits, he who was of the lie chose to do the worst things, but the most holy spirit, clothed in rugged heaven, truth, and did all who sought with seal to do with pleasure of the wise Lord by his good works. Between the two demons did not choose r- rightly, for they deliber- deliberated delusion overcame them so that they chose the most evil mind. Then, see, that they didn't, there was one, sh- one had the choice of evil and good, and one had the choice of, sorry, evil, one had the choice of good, but they both, unfortunately, within the Zoroastrian myth, chose evil. And then a court rushed headlong into fury that they might thereby extinguish the existence of mortal men. Now, isn't that very interesting in comparison to the days that we live today? Uh, that the control, the psychopathic control group, the Western civilization destroyers, have all chosen the work of evil and one is their primary goal that they all share share hand they all share in common well they want to destroy humanity either by AI transhumanism or biotech methods it, it always comes back there's nothing new there's nothing new now in there was a light the you know Mitraism you know the the religion that was from which Christianity originally came from the Persian religion, okay? And that's associated with a guy, you know, killing a bull. But the, the actual Mitra himself is a lion-headed god. And he's identical in description to Aram, Araman, uh, the Zoroastrian concept of evil, the devil, the most evil mind, ruler of death and destruction. And where, you know, that statue of Mitra is front and center, front and center of the Vatican Museum. So even when the truth is a talking about the Vatican is built on Satanism, well, they don't have the intelligence or education to know that there's some truth to that. It's really being bound, built upon the foundation of... Oh, no, I know, you know, it's Vatican and the Etruscans and all that. But I'm talking about the actual Vatican itself. The actual, you know, the, the throne of St. Peter. It's, it, it's a monument to the, to the fall of man in terms of the artwork on displays. There was also or, or another one called Orzam, Ormazes, or something like that. I can't pronounce Ormazes. It's spelled, let me look here. It's spelled O-H-R-M-A-Z-D. Ormaz. And that's the, the opposite, the principle of truth and light. Riding on a horseback and trampled on Araman's snake-covered head. Zoroastrians believe that the perpetual struggle between these two... I, you know these two extremes would end in the eventual triumph of good and this was a major driving element of the kind of counsel and wisdom 
that was found among the kings of ancient pagan Persia. Zoroastrians will tell you that their religion is the ultimate religion of free will. Not only is Ariman the evil spirit evil by choice, and that the Holy Spirit is holy and good by choice, but that the one supreme God has also to commit himself and has chose between truth and lie. And they call him Ahura Mazdas, Mazda. He chooses truth and holy and good, righteous mindedness. And we are given our own free will to know that we can choose this ourselves if we want. This is why, in terms of organized religion, Zoroastrianism was kind of like, you know, a very intelligent religion that gave everyone free will. It didn't say you were damned or you were good by nature. It said you have the choice to choose your free will. The Gathas, you know, which is most people believe was written by Zarawaster, the prophet himself, the supreme God aligns himself with the Holy Spirit against the power of the lie. The evil spirit, on the other hand, chooses to lead the powers of the lie against the Holy Spirit and therefore against the supreme God. But through this he is the sworn enemy of the Holy Spirit. He is also known as his twin. See, we're getting really, we're really getting into uh, you know Neoplatonism and dualist concepts here. Uh, and Zoroastra, Zoroastrianism, Zoroaster, is not a dualism, but all in all a form of monotheism, the belief in one God, and the sense that wisdom is the ultimate thing that divides reality along lines of good and evil and it's purely a dualistic mindset according to free will that's why Zoroastrians were terribly persecuted by Islam for the simple reason that it was the exact, exact opposite of Islam it said you don't have to follow these strict rules you make the choice and whatever happens to you that's part of that choice and both are an expression of God both the wickedness and the good and I suppose like you know, or some of the Orthodox Jewish sects are the same thing as well. God is as much of a terrifying demonic entity as it is a loving spirit. And you've got you have to choose which God you follow. And we poor bastards in the Western world ended up what? We ended up with the Abrahamic religions, monotheism. And we're broken we've been broken ever since wrecked and Crowley back to him again right he wanted to destroy Christianity uh, he, you know and again he was using satires and bringing Crowleyanity but one of the first things he ever did to actually undermine and bring in the Aeon of Horus was the rites of Elysium which was he tried which he restored as a a heresy when the first things banned by the Christians was the rites of Elysium and because it was central to both Hellenic and Roman Latin paganism and these mysteries were so appalling to the Abrahamics that it was the first thing they they, they used to call them filthy names and the only filthy horrors take part and even though these were family festivals back in the day and they betrayed them as very dark and uh, sexually depraved but they weren't really and Crowley attempted in Caxton Hall in London to revive the rites of Elysium and of course it uh, it, it's just there's photographs and everything there of it and that was it actually worked in many ways because it was the end kind of like the Christian world was in decline ever since. Now, and let's talk about the rights. This, let, let's talk about what the, the rites of Eleusium or the Eleusium mysteries and the secret rituals of Demeter that terrorized the Abrahamic so much that they used them as the basis for persecution of all witchcraft, sorceries, and paganism ever since. Now they were held in honour as a set of Demeter and Persephone 
Well, these were the Eleusian mysteries, as they were called, and they were ceremonies of initiation that were annually celebrated at Eleusius in Attica in Greece. The nature of these was a closely guarded secret, so there's a very much a magical you know, aspect to it. Any breach of which, which of these secrets was put, liable to be punished by debt. Originally, they were a purely local cult, and they were restricted to single families or clans within Attica, and their secrecy had been sometimes explained as due to their original restrictions, like a family secret. We go back to like a La Costa Nostra thing again, but it was probably due to the sense of awe and fear which was felt by those who took part in these ceremonies, which were deeply connected to forces of life and death. Now, the rites of Eleusius, or the Eleusian mysteries, like all the rituals of Demeter and Persephone, and the mysteries were in origin, they were agricultural, just like just about all that stuff. A comparison with similar rituals in other societies show that the process of agriculture tended to be associated with ceremonies of initiation in those which govern the life of men. It is therefore probable that already in their early stages of personal significance was attached to the mystery. So there was already a pagan Indo-European concept of agricultural uh, ritualization connected to these before they actually officially became, you know, the Elys- the Eleusian mysteries as we know them in their in their actual conceptual form. Now, when Attica became a unified state in ancient Greece, the Eleusian mysteries were incorporated and were led to an expansion of membership outside that of the original clan or family. And the legend dates this to the mythologi- mythological periods, but adds that Eleusia was allowed to keep control of the mysteries according to the Greek writers of the era. Now, Athens did not interfere much in the cult in Attica and its workings during the early historical Hellenic period. In the Homeric hymn to Demeter, which we know for a fact dates from around the 7th or 6th century BC, he does not refer to Athens or Athenian elements of the cult. The management of the mysteries appears to have been in the hands of the Eleusian families that existed in the area from where it was drawn. This title indicates it was revealed as sacred objects by the chief priest at Eleusia. Eleusia, sorry. Some stage, however, this management was shared with the family who had connections with the Athenian royalty or the Athenian, you know, religious power forces. And they provided a torchbearer and the herald who were the other chief officials of this local cult. And then Athenian influence first becomes, you know, connected all this about the 6th century BC with the building of an enlarged building a hall of initiation towards the end of that century and the construction was done in accordance with Eleusian deities at Athens. So interesting that a local cult regarding these mysteries surrounding Demeter within a family ended up taking over the power source at the center of Hellenic society in religious religious in terms of religious sense but within Hellenic society just like in all the ancient societies there was very little difference between the actual workings of state and the Hellenic or the underlying mythological or theological concepts so the initiation of you know with the Demetrius and Persephone rites took place in Athens and were then known as the lesser and the second as the greater mystery. So you had the you had at Eleusius you had the, the greater mysteries, the deeper mysteries, and at Athens you had the lesser mysteries. And then a further development opened with the mysteries to all who could speak the, the, the Greek language, the ancient Greek language. Provided they were free of pollution, whatever that meant. I I think that might have been I don't know what they meant by free of pollution. Uh, pollution in I think in the ancient theological sense is uh, uh, venereal diseases uh, and uh, other behavioural things such as alcoholism and so on. Now the first real evidence we have comes from Her- Herodotus, the Greek writer of the 15th, the 5th century BC 
in which he set at the time of the battle of Salamis in 480 BC. And this tells how a great cloud of dust, like that of procession to Eleusius, was seen moving towards Salamis, and the sound, like a cry made during the procession, was heard. The story was taken as a sign that the Eleusian deities had come to the aid of Greece in her struggle against Persia. So you're always, ta- you're always hearing me talking about the auguries, and this is how it worked in ancient times. So basically, on the eve of a battle, or during a battle, the cloud of dust stirred up was like the procession at Eleusius, and this was seen as an augury uh, that the deities Demeter and Persephone of the Eleusian mysteries had come to the aid of Athens and Greece as a whole. And this is what this myth, this particular aspect of the myth, the the, the dust on the rise d- during the struggle against the Persians is what led to the popularity of the mysteries and became central to Athenian social propaganda during the 5th and 6th centuries. And the, as a result, the mystery, Eleusian mysteries achieved enormous prestige and status within ancient Greek society and remained so up until the Roman period, way down to the Roman period, right until, amazingly, a th- a thousand years later, in the 4th century AD, when they were finally destroyed by Christians. Now, the archaeological evidence we... Sh- and this is... It must have had some power, because not only did the early Christians, you know, forbid the Eleusian mysteries, they absolutely went to war on it, like you would not believe. If you look at the early Christian documents on the banning or the prohibitions against the Eleusian mysteries, the rabbis... You know, that's what you Christians, your, your, your early church fathers were called. Uh, the Second Temple, the Second Temple rabbinical, you know, infiltrators were would talk about the rites of Eleusium in the most degrading and appalling ways, which tells you that it was really powerful. Same thing happened here, here in Ireland with the Crom Crew cult, cult. They 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 talked about it in the most de- despicable ways. Why? Because it works. So a big, a big part of the Eleusian mysteries was the concept of the torchlight and the darkness and the whole kind of mystery school, mystery play thing. You've, seen, you've heard me writing about this on my book, The Amble of the Psyche, which is free on my substack to read. And the archaeological evidence does show a series of buildings on the site uh, with, from the time onwards, but the first literary evidence for the cult is found in the Homeric hymns. This throws light on some of the preliminary rituals and one of these was the purification ceremony in which the initiate was seated on a stool with his head veiled and his foot resting on a ram's fleece while a priest or a priestess purified him in the hymn Demeter is portrayed performing a similar ritual ritual sorry and her arrival at the palace of the ruler of Eleusius on later monuments Heracles is shown undergoing the same purification. Now, this purification would have been a fire either burning around them to burn any, you know, pollution out of the air, or also the fire being brought, you know, on torches being ritually uh, moved around the body to some kind of incantation or maybe like a sound of a drum. And we have those in Ireland with the the May the bat you know the the Beltana festivals, the lines of cattle would be purified by running them through a, you know, making them go through a kind of a valley of fire, well, not burning them, but the fire on either side to purify the cattle. Uh, fasting was also a big thing of the rites of Eleusium, and uh, of Eleusia, sorry, and uh, well, it was Eleusium later, and to him. The Homeretic hymn describes how Demeter fasted for nine days when looking at Persephone and how she would not accept food or wine in the palace of Eleusia. She also carried torches in her search and these played an important part in the ritual. There were dances by torchlight around the well and the fire of the called the fair dances at Eleusia and the well is mentioned in the hymn itself. It is still visible at the entrance to this day at the sanctuary, the dancing form part of the all-night festival. Now, Demeter 
fest that Demeter's fasting is broken when she is made to laugh by jokes of a servant called Lamb. She then asks for the drinks of barley and water, flavoured with the herb Penny Royal. In the cult, fasting was also broken with a simple drink and the making of coarse and obscene jokes called, you know, satires. And these satires were common to many rituals fertility took place during the preliminaries of the mysteries. So, you know, that's one of the reasons why Abrahamics and today Wokies and, you know, cultural Marxists ban offensive jokes because offensive jokes have a spiritual element. They break down what you might call the ego to a lot of it will be laughing at yourself, satires, bardic stuff. And this allows a state where a state of grace to occur and charisma to be invoked. And one of the reasons that the cultural Marxists today and the Wokies ban quote unquote offensive jokes and want comics and people say, you know, told a racist or a or a you know a sexist joke to be destroyed is because they're trying to destroy communion with the self, with the higher self. Literally when you have somebody banning a comedian or banning anyone, you know, someone finds someone at work finds somebody who posted a joke years ago that they think they can use against him and go, you know your man down in that department who posted a joke about Pakistanis 20 years ago? Let's get him sacked. Uh, they think in their mind, they are using the work of pure evil. Anyone, and you remember this for the rest of your life, anyone who ever tries to use someone's old jokes or old satire against them are so demonically evil that's why they're often smirking and using pregnant pauses and trying to make out it's something really damning when they're conveying it you're seeing an absolute beast of a demon vomiting forth from the abyss because they're only words but they are words satires they are jokes that allow a communion with the divine and this is why everything from cults to feminists to wokies to cultural marxists to abrahamics to puritans they destroy the smutty joke because the smutty joke allows the mortal to indulge the gods and if you tell a joke that's offensive or smutty or anything like that or dirty and it makes the gods laugh the god you've shown that you have the ability to affect the gods and you receive charisma the gift of grace now within the later mystery the hymns of Demeter sorry the hymn goes on to describe Demeter's attempt to immortalize the king to immortalize a king by placing him in the fire every night and her detection by the child's mother and the consequent failure of this project so she doesn't actually make him a, you know a, 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 a god or give him immortality if fire is often connected with immortality you know like the flame of the eternal this and that there there might be that goes back to ancient greece as well there might be a reference here to preliminary purification in which the fire was probably used meaning that the immortality is not so much the immortality of life or biology but the immortality of the spirit to purification of pollution it has been however been suggested not interesting that the the the, the wokies who also want to ban the, who are obsessed with banning jokes and smut and st offensive jokes and smut are not really interested in pollution when it comes to the natural world they see carbon the food of life as a pollution do you see we're still in the, we're still against the battle we're still in battle with the same demons they just manifest in different forms and the structure we use such as mythology such as what i've been talking about on tonight's broadcast is the means to understand them and then combat against them it has however been suggested that the story uh, is has a deeper significance in that Demeter's nursing of the child reflects adoption of each initiate by the goddess in the mysteries and these are reborn through baptism of fire so the initiate experience the rebirth and the promise of new life well there you go that's exactly why the Abrahamics ban banned it uh, because at the 
the rites of Eleusius in the Eleusian Mysteries, you're given the gift of charisma, the gift of the gods. Now, when the mysteries and these these ended up in Athens, uh, the ceremonies actually became more complex, which is amazing, which generally happens anyway because it enters into a bigger society. The for the early stages I just spoke about were you know the ones of purification, then they were later followed by things called the lesser mysteries, which Henry spoke about earlier, and they took place in February and March. The purpose was also mainly that of purification, and that included washing of the washing in the river Eleusius. Eleusius, spelled differently. We are told that they had some kind of instructive content and prepared the initiates for the, the, initiates for the greater mysteries. Uh, these took place in September, October. You can actually see the, you know, the, the agricultural elements here, you know, the planting and harvesting seed instance. Uh, from the 15th to the 23rd day, uh, there were two grades of initiation and a year had to elapse before one was admitted to the final grade, which is known as the Eportia, meaning the spectacle or the vision. Mm, interesting. Before the festival, the sacred objects were brought to Athens from Eleusius, and in their nature, we just don't know what they are today, but it's presumed that these were the Hierophant and the chief priest revealed during the ceremonies, and they were kept in secret boxes like tabernacles. And in fact, the word tabernacle goes back to those times. It's, it's a pre-Christian, pre-Abrahamic Abrahamic concept, and were often representatives of art. So, you know, this now you know why the iconoclasts hate art, because, again, art, like satire, is the enemy of the the the, the, the ones who wish to control nature on this earth against nature's natural order the enemies of natural law the festival began with a a solemn assembly at Athens during which the proclamation was made which stated that these classes of people who were forbidden to take part in the initiation this was followed on the 16th day by a journey to the sea where the initiates took a sacred bath now that you saw that in the Wicker Man, that's where they got that from. The whole parade, um, the May Day parade, all he- that Christopher Lee as Lord Summerisle leads, they were actually not doing a a pagan festival from Nord from the Celtic world, but were actually doing a version of the Rites of Eleusium, and that's why they went to the sea and gave a barrel of um, beer to um, Poseidon or ne- so or Neptune. So the uh, when they got to the sea. Uh, pigs were sacrificed and an official sacrifice to Demeter and Persephone took place on the following day and on the 18th day the, the initiates rested. Now the great procession to Eleusius took place either on the 19th or the 20th of the month and these were called the Icarus processions after the deity who personified the cry which was made during it. The journey was a long one, some 14 miles and it was interrupted by many, many ceremonies along the way. This included dancing, singing, hymns and sacrifices. There was also the form of obscene humour again, in which prominent citizens were abused through satire. So the kings or the, the big shots, they'd make fun of them. Very important. On arrival, this is no wonder the Abrahamics band, band, band On arrival, there was a night festival and further dancing. This is portrayed as a votive tablet found at Eleusius, meaning it was buried under the ground, uh, about the main ceremonies of the mysteries, and it took place on the following day and stays inside the temple or the sanctuary. Much less is known of this, though. The various stages of the building itself have been excavated, and the one which dates from the time of Pericles in the second half of the 5th century BC has a vast structure of approximately 51 metres in length and width, along the sides with tiers of steps so it was an, an arena kind of event wide enough to accommodate the audience of 4,000 spect- spect- spectators it is taught that the small room stood in the centre of the hall forming the Holy of Holies you see that even that isn't, isn't even an Abrahamic concept in which the Hierophant would appear when he displayed the sacred objects to the 4,000 who were allowed inside the ritual took Three forms, things spoken, things performed, and things revealed. The first of these are thought to have been brief sentences rather than long expositions, and we are told by Aristotle that the 
initiates did not go to Eleusis to learn, but to have an experience and to put it into a receptive state of mind. Other authors emphasize an emotional experience of the initiates of the mysteries, whose reactions are said to be religious awe and fear, and at the close of the ceremonies, joy, encouragement and hope. See, you're brought through the entire stage. You're brought to the whole thing. How we could do with these kinds of things today. What we have lost. But then again, in ancient Athens, they wouldn't have given it to everybody. The NPCs wouldn't have been available, wouldn't have been welcome. They had a a specific list of who wasn't to go there. They would have picked, people would have been picked who were worthy of receiving the the mysteries, not just anybody. Uh, Today we have the inverse of that. Instead of going to the Eleusian sanctuary, the the fuckers go to Epstein's island. Now the story of Demeter's passion and her search for Persephone and the joy at her return was central to the mysteries, but it is not known how this was represented or referred to within the mysteries themselves. Any form of dramatic representation appears to have been ruled out by nature of the actual cult itself. There were, however, important dramatic effects from the interchange of darkness and light and the sudden blaze of torches at the climax of the mysteries as often mentioned by writers in antiquity. Now, there's also the cult of the single ear of corn around this. And the Christian writers who were, you know, writing against the, the, you know, the, the pagans, and they suspect on the grounds of prejudice, of course, and also of confusion with other pagan cults. Several authors refer to the sacred marriage between Zeus and Demeter in, in relation to the mysteries, and the Christian writer Asterius accuses Eleusius of celebrating a union between the Hierophant and the priestess, in which an under in an underground chamber, meaning you know, uh, sex, sex magic. The Eleusian myths do not refer to the marriage of Zeus and Demeter, but to that of Hades and Persephone. Originally, the fine couple appear to have been anonymous, but then sometimes referred to as simply the god and the goddess. It is, however, a ritual union. Now, you can see this is also the basis of the Gnostic Mass that was also created by, you know, the, the time of Crowley and the Golden Dawn. You know about the Gnostic Mass from things like uh, Jack Parsons and the uh, Agape Temple in Pasadena. If, however, the, a ritual union was enacted at Eleusis, it cannot have taken place in the sanctuary where there are no underground chambers. Another Christian writer, Herophilus, implies that there was a kind of sacred marriage, and he adds that during the mysteries of the Hierophant announced at the birth of the second child of the goddess. A second valuable testimony is given by Hippolytheus about the rite, and the name indicates the essential nature of this form of revelation. References to the mystery throughout antiquity stress that there was a vision of them that gave the initiate their hopes for the future. Some kind of vision was revealed. According to the writer, the supreme revelation was simply the showing of a single ear of corn. This may seem hard to believe, but they're eager to suggest that the primitive nature of such a revelation, but in the agricultural basis of Demeter's worship, is re- is remembered, and the analogy is that was felt between the life of the corn and that of men. So we're back to kind of like correspondences again. One may be less inclined to question this testimony. The mysteries were celebrated near the season of the autumn sowing. And their foundation is linked to the myth of of the rape and return of Persephone, who personifies the corn which was sown in the earth and came to life again in the spring. In the symbol of the ear of corn, the initians may likewise have seen the promise of a new life beyond the grave. They were then corresponding to the concept of grain being re-sown as their own rebirth. This is, you know, it's classical paganism, isn't it? At the same time, the child of the goddess of the earth was sometimes called Platus, the god of wealth, who in the Homeric hymn is sent by Demeter and Persephone to the house of the man whom they love. And the divine birth and revelation of the corn also have been representative for the initiates in the hope of prosperity 
in their present life. We do not know much about the closing stages of the festival, but many authors speak of the encouragement and expectation of a better life to come, in which visitors of the mysteries carried away with them. How far this involved moral resolutions is hard to determine, although it does seem that it was a kind of rudimentary ethical code of Lucius, which encouraged respect for family, fellow citizens, foreigners, people of lower classes, slaves and humanity as a whole and this is why the Abrahamics banned it and then re-portrayed it as a filthy degraded horrible festival of depravity and wickedness and what are they doing to us now if you look at western civilization as it exists today we look back to say the golden age of what it was in America, you had the American dream. In the past, in, in Europe, you might have had, you know, the fa- the family, the traditional lifestyle. The father goes to the pub. Uh, the mother raises the kids. They have weekends together. They have a nice life. They create great, beautiful memories for the child. This is now being portrayed as white privilege uh, by the, the Abrahamic demons of today who reimagine themselves as the transhumanists and the cultural Marxists. What we see is the kind of demons behind the world you know the the the, the world economic forum i i wish i was this there are to, like i'm very happy with where i am in this world but there are times i wish i could actually get on the shows like like joe rogan or meet people like you know tucker carlson and explain to them that yes these demonic forces they've been always been there and they've been protected on this earth by certain elements and they, you know, the early Christians who took over the Roman Empire with the first great reset one were doing the same thing that the current transhumanist, you know, cultural Marxists are doing today. They're taking away what was beautiful, the concept of Western civilization, for all its faults, just like they did to the rites of Elysium, and they called it they what they called filthy and degrading, then and evil and wicked. They're now calling white privilege offensive you know the old way the, it has to be removed it wasn't diverse enough it has to be smashed and they're smashing it so they're smashing it at the same time degrading it and what do both sides have that are central to both first the sense of wonder both the Eleusian mysteries and the traditional path through western society were filled with a sense of majesty that this what you were you were you were blessed to be a part of something wonderful, and we had a whole canon of literature, and art and everything to go along with that, and when they smashed the rites of Elysium, you had this primitive awful art, taking that was going on in, in ancient Rome, and the same is happening here today, you have awful things just garbage and you know and pop music and everything, and, you know you you grew up in a time. Like when I was growing up, I was very aware in the 80s that I was very fortunate to be alive at this period. My life was filled with remarkable experience and lusciousness. And now I'm seeing, and that was the same right through to the early 90s when they started taking it away, and particularly after 9-11. And here they are again today. That, But we always have to remember that although they smashed the rights of Elysium, or the rites of Eleusius, the Eleusian mysteries, that those people came back in the Renaissance, in the Protestant Enlightenment, and had great success with Western civilization. Likewise, they're doing it again to us now with the Second Great Reset, driven by the same non-human demons behind them, these Koranzonic hordes. And we again we will we will triumph but we'll have to deal with what they throw at us in the meantime you know you, I, I encourage if anyone wants to know the future that awaits us and what's going on in the early parts of it now is go look at the chronology of what was done to pagans by Christians in the first 500 years after the Edict of Milan and, the, and what was done and then you will see it happening again today where our sacred beliefs are torn asunder they destroy our 
heroes. They pulled down their statues and throwed them in the river. They, they, the iconoclasts, the NPCs who were the automatons of the demon world are sent out there to wreck these things. And what was the beginning of it in this stage? A black cube representing Black Lives Matter. The blackness, the darkness of the further reaches of the abyss beyond Saturn, which we cannot see. And that's why I'm still here. That's why you're still listening. There's a handful of us who know that what was there was better. And it has been the liberty taken from us and it's not a natural evolutionary thing. So if you're still awake and you haven't been bored to death by this, uh, until the next VON, you will have a Hocus Focus with Sarah coming up. And don't forget, I have the book. If you want to reward me or thank me for this, you can buy the book and in the link below in the descriptions. And uh, you, you remember your sacredness. You remember that you can make a god or a goddess laugh. And that's what I mean when I say, feck them if they can't take a joke.